Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Advent Member Talks. My name is Sam, my pronouns are they, them, and I am the Director of Member Experience uh, here at Advent Coworking. We are a creative co-working community, an event space, a yoga studio, a podcast studio, and an art gallery. Most importantly, though, is that community. And we love this weekly event that we get to put on. Each week features a different member on the topic of their choosing. And it's just a really cool opportunity for our members to skill share, um, share all their amazing knowledge that they have, and then also for us to be able to promote our members and, um, you know, share that not only within the Advent community, but with the greater Charlotte entrepreneurial community. Um, so if you have any questions today, we have Jennifer uh, joining us. So if you have any questions, um, please go ahead, type those into the comments, um, and we're going to have a short Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you and then we'll, yeah, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So um, what I wanted to talk about is something that if any of us who are in teaching, coaching, consulting, training positions may not think about. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is um, for the average entrepreneur or person that gets into training, we start out by being a master at whatever content area that we're involved in. Maybe we start out being a yoga instructor or um, 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 somebody who guides meditation or in the IT world or an engineer or whatever your field is, um, a historian. It, it, it doesn't matter any field. We have spent time in that field. We've cultivated our expertise and our knowledge. And hey, we honestly have it going on when it comes to that field. Then we're like, you know what? Maybe I don't wanna work for somebody else. <laughs> or uh, maybe I wanna teach other people how to do this thing. And so we begin exploring coaching options or training options, maybe even creating courses online. Um, all, all of these different expressions of sharing our years of experience with somebody else. And then all of a sudden we get into this space where it's not just about the math, or the engineering, or the meditation, or the yoga, but it's also now about creating these relationships with our students, whoever they are, old or new clients, whatever we call them, and causing that information and mastery that we have to then be what they have that they can live out and get their own results, which is why they're paying us, right? And then we start to notice some concerns or, questions even like, are they really getting it? How do I know if they're really getting it? Maybe you even had an experience where somebody's like, you know what, I, I didn't get that. And I didn't get the results that you said I would, what's up? And then that's hard to hear because as people of integrity who want to deliver what we say we're going to deliver, we're like, well, I, I know how to do it. I shared with you everything I know. Why, what's in the gap here? That's what we're talking about today. Because one of the things I've learned, and, and I've been a teacher for, for 11 years, and um, in my field, I teach history, literature, uh, rhetoric, philosophy, and logic. Uh, I also have started multiple businesses. Um, before teaching, I created custom art and um, on canvas and ornaments. And, and so I've played with lots of business and teaching. And as I've met other entrepreneurs, other coaches, other trainers, I've realized that what is in the gap is actually the skills of teaching. And um, because the skills of teaching are different than the skills of whatever you're doing, the skills to be an amazing um, yoga participant are not the same skills and it seems weird saying that because I hear my yoga teacher saying, it's just about going back to breath, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, it are not the same as teaching. So what are the skills of teaching? So when I teach my teachers how to teach, so we have two things at, at my company, Padea Fellowship. I have a teacher training program for teachers at home and school and then, a, um, and then an online academy. Um, but what I teach them is there's really five realms five categories that we can think about what's at work when we're learning how to teach something or teaching something. The first I like to call the philosopher. This is pretty much where everyone is already. If you love your content area, you are here. Socrates says that wonder is the feeling of a philosopher and 
my goodness, it's true. We just get excited. We can geek out about this thing that we love all day long. Um, the skills of the philosopher are curiosity and wonder. And if you already love your content area, you're already here. Um, the next realm is the realm of the facilitator. This is marked by a love of form. This is in the, in the education space would be deciding what books to use, scheduling out the year, all the logistical things that it requires to run a classroom, knowing how much time it's gonna take and how many pages I should schedule for them to read this week, all of those logistical things. I understand that love of learning plays a big role, but it's not enough to get the work done. There's also form that gets to be in place, otherwise, the bottom line is not going to happen. So it's this marriage of inspiration and, uh, and form. Um, one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry, he talks about the two muses and he says, there's the muse of inspiration with inarticulate visions and the muse of form that returns again to say, it is yet harder than you thought. <laughs> and so, um, and so, oh, sorry. Um, and so between the philosopher and the facilitator, it's a union of those two muses really, that um, what the inspiration actually has a place to go to be manifested and made known to whoever you're teaching, um, both of those together. The next realm is ca I, call, I call the mentor. The mentor is marked by their experience and their wisdom. Um, if you were in the realm of um, say a literature class, you could talk about um, and your specialty was Greek literature. You could talk about all the Greek literature. You could say, you know, this is what Homer wrote. This is what he wrote about. This was, you know, where the culture he was coming from. You could just go on and on giving information about Homer and the work. If um, you are a yoga teacher, you could go on and on about the history of yoga and what the poses mean. It was lots of information about this art and this craft. Um, again, marked by your wisdom and your experience. Um, and, and it really expresses itself in knowledge, knowledge that you can only get by having done the hard work of learning your craft. The next stage, and this is where I noticed that most, most coaches, trainers, facilitators, even employers, like this applies even if you aren't coaching somebody, if you have employees that you have to train, you also are in the role of a teacher. This is where I find that most people get frustrated. They're like, I love this stuff. We, we have a system for how to implement it. I can talk about it, but they're still not getting it. When you start noticing that you can do the thing in front of your clients, in front of your staff, but you can't externalize the internal process or they're still not getting it, you are now on the threshold of entering the realm of coach. And the skill set of coach is a, really what a coach is, is somebody who can externalize an internal process. That um, I like to use a basketball um, example. So my son plays basketball in, in basketball practice. They will put up like 200 shots and the coach will scrutinize the way his arm is formed, um, the direction he's standing, the way his legs are like, I'm not a basketball player, so I'm probably not even talking about it correctly, but he will detail all the things about his body and be very precise. Ballet is the same way. You know, they're going to scrutinize the way your foot is turned. Um, you can do the same thing in yoga and any, you know, engineering, any field. Um, and and, and so they see something, they have like x-ray vision. Have you ever been in the room with somebody where they're like, they just notice what you're doing wrong. You're like, how did you see that? And why are you criticizing everything I'm doing? I mean, it can feel that way a little bit, but mostly it's, I see what you don't see. Um, and then there's like, how do I coach you how to do it? Well, coaching only comes by showing. So it's a love of the process and this discernment and insight that, for example, when it comes to reading, I know what it feels like to enter deeply into a work of literature. And I can use analogies and metaphors with my students to help them tap into that feeling. So when they then read the work of literature, they know what to do. Um, and then they practice it. And then I hear what they did and they tell me what they noticed. 
And then I give them feedback and then they go back and try again. That is coaching. A lot of times in our society, and it's, it's normal and natural because we are, you know, a um, empirical evidence is like the main thing. Like, you know, just give me the facts, ma'am, and let's move on. Um, we have a tendency to prioritize, just give me the information as though that's all we need. But when it comes to something that's a skill, like writing, building, reading, painting, dancing or anything else that's a thing you do, a skill, it requires externalizing that internal process and then the feedback loop of observing, feedback, try again, observing, feedback, try again. And then lastly, um, the last realm, and I just call it master teacher, um, but they have an ability to notice where a student is, to observe where their employee, student or client is, and perceive at any moment what their student needs, whether they need to give information, whether they need to coach a skill or co-inquire into an idea. And that's the third thing you can do. Like sometimes it's not, oh, this, they need information. They need to know about the background of this, this novel or they need to know the history of this thing. Or it, maybe it's not, they need skill. Maybe there's a concept they're not getting. Like, um, I actually had this experience recently in yoga. I love yoga. Um, I was, Shavasana is like the last pose. And I just always thought it was time to go to sleep. I knew there was something in me that knew that that wasn't quite it. But I was like, I can't figure out what it is. I mean, it's like nap time, right? And this la like last week, I finally had a breakthrough and understanding about what Shavasana was. Really, it was resting my will. And so I had this epiphany, this light bulb moment about what it was. And all of a sudden, then my body knew how to relax in it. I had, um, and, it, and, it was, and it was through the experience, but through time with my teacher and class after class after class that this opened up for me. And she couldn't have made me have that light bulb moment. It was only through time with her and patience and every class giving us a little bit more and a little bit more. And then what? And now like it, I have all these connections for other things in life. Like I'm so excited about this concept that I now understand a little more. Um, and so that's this idea of co crying, just present, uh, presenting ideas. So those, those, those are the three things that we can then teach. So the master teacher, whether it's in the classroom and home in your company, um, a business to business relationship, some sort of client that you have, it's always the same stuff, no matter what your field is. You have these five realms that you can play with in terms of how you interact with your content, but then each of these goes along with what you can provide your students. With the philosopher, you invite them to be curious and wonder. With the facilitator, you invite them to form. Like, this is the way we do things. This is the structure. This is orientation. With the mentor, you present knowledge. With the coach, you coach skills. You externalize the internal process. And the master teacher, you can do all of those things and co-inquire into ideas. I mean, technically, co-inquiring into ideas kind of floats all over the place. These aren't linear. They're really like, I actually visualize them like a big map of Middle Earth. Yes, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. And, uh, and you can kind of like dance around them. And we tend, by the way, we each have a, a tendency towards one or the other. Like we tend to be more on the philosopher side naturally or the facilitator side. I am definitely much more the philosopher. Um, and I always need facilitators on my team to be like, yo, Jed, we actually need a schedule here. And I'm like, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> and they need me to like bring some life and inspiration and vision and say, okay, more is possible here. We don't have to stay stuck in the mud. Um, and so we need each other, but we each have a tendency. And so what that tells us though, is that based on your tendency, most likely you're weaker in the other area. So that's your opportunity. That's your opportunity for growth and um, leveling up and how you teach. And maybe that might be the space where your clients are experiencing a gap. If I'm not as strong in the facilitator, presenting a system that they can follow with clarity, well, guess what? My clients aren't going to have as, be um, 
uh, the greatest results because they're going to be confused and not know what to do next. So I get to I get to shift in that area. If I am new to my field, like I, I maybe I know how to read closely, but I found that I'm teaching a book for the very first time, which happens all the time when you're teaching. Um, I have to dig into commentaries and get help from external guides to give me the knowledge I need that my students are going to need. Um, if I know a ton of awesome stuff about all the literature, but I haven't been able to externalize my, the process, I get to spend time contemplating that internal process that I go through. And by the way, if you are naturally an intuitive person, that will be a very, it'll be a challenge for you. Um, I'm naturally intuitive and it was the hardest breakthrough I had as a teacher, but one of the most beneficial ones. I had a student who was super sensing, just like, I don't know if you're Myers-Briggs people or not, but the sensing versus the intuitive, I mean, almost a hundred percent sensing. And I would be like, you know what I mean, right? And he's like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> he's like, I need you to tell me. And so I had to like get a cup of coffee and just one Saturday, just sat around thinking about what I did, thinking about how I read, thinking about how I created the results I had in my own life and really laying out that process, really saying, what was I feeling, thinking, and doing before I had this outcome? What was I feeling, thinking, or doing before this happened or that happened? When I failed that one time, what was I feeling, thinking, or doing? And how was it different than the time I succeeded? This constant comparison. And by doing that, patterns will begin to emerge in your craft and all of a sudden you'll have this thing to present your people and guide them through. So when it comes to the master teacher realm, the thing that you're doing really has more to do with ways of being than a particular checkbox of thing that you can do. It's a lot like returning to the philosopher and curiosity, but with all the experience and the wisdom of the other realms. In addition to that, it's combined with mindfulness and attentiveness. Because if we're busy, and this is where our, our internal work as a leader comes in, um, and I, I think a lot of people don't like to think about this, but I tell my teachers up front, I'm like, if you don't do your personal work, you're not gonna be a great teacher. Because it will be the thing that you're, you know, for example, if you're reading a book and you have feelings about that book, and your resistance to go there, guess what you're not gonna be able to do? You're not gonna be able to teach that book. You're not gonna be able to go into those ideas without, without your prejudices or assumptions or whatever they are. Um, it, it, it's important to create an open and free space where all of that can happen. And that happens by dealing with your own prejudices, dealing with your own concerns, knowing what they are, not having to get rid of them. Like we all have that kind of stuff, but being able to witness them, being able to witness them and notice, oh, I have that uh, bias. I have that prejudice. I have that thing. And hopefully as we grow as humans, you know, we become more neutral to things, have less prejudices, all of those kinds of things. Um, and it's a process. Um, but if you know it, then you can be like, oh yeah, my bias is totally coloring this. So uh, this is the feedback I'm going to give them. You know, so that's really important. But when we're unaware and even unwilling to look, we actually see less because if we close off our sight to ourselves, we automatically close off our sight to everything else around us. You can't choose what you close your sight off to because it's a faculty or a power of your mind that, that it's almost like closing your eyes because you don't want to see something scary, but then you can't see anything. The, there's, there's organs in our mind that are, are organs of truth perception or reality perception. And when we close those off because we don't want to face ourselves, because we don't want to face an idea, because we're uncomfortable in a situation, because that woman has too many feelings. I don't think I want to, you know, have a conversation with her. You know, we're closed off to certain experiences. We close ourselves off to everything else, which means perceiving our clients with accuracy so that we can really see how to help them and get them amazing results and then be wildly loyal. Um, so 
asking what our clients, students and employees need in any given moment is the path forward to becoming a master teacher in whatever realm that you're in, um, whether it be knowledge, skills, ideas, uh, just being able to give them permission to be curious, any of those realms. If, if all you do is ask, okay, in this moment, there's a breakdown, there's a gap, something's not happening, what is missing? Think through those areas. Are we not curious enough? Are we missing a piece of knowledge? Is there a skill that's not refined? Or is there a concept that they're missing? Not only can you give your clients better results, but you can even can make your employee training more successful. Um, because maybe it's not that they have an attitude, maybe they just don't understand and they're embarrassed and they don't know how to ask that question. You know, when my students are frustrated, they won't reach out sometimes because they're like, I don't even know what to ask. I'm like, well then say that. Just be like, Miss Dow, I'm so confused. I don't even know what to ask. And as the teacher, I'm the master. So I know what questions to ask, that's my job. And I'm like, your job is to just reach out. So um, it also allows us to have a more gracious view of our clients, of our students, rather than seeing them as a problem or insubordinate or whatever, you know, we see them as people really trying their best and we get to help them by having clearer sight because we're asking the right questions. So thank you. And I would love to take questions <laughs> if anyone has them. Yes, thank you so much. That was like so many little gems that I'm just like writing down over here. Um, Good. I did not know that about the end of the yoga practice. I also thought it was just a time to try and like chill. <laughs> so thank you for that insight. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my dad's professor and growing up, one thing that he always taught us is like, when you have the ability to teach someone else what you know, that's when you've mastered that skill. So I don't know if that's fully like in line with kind of your practice and teaching, but that's kind of how I've always understood mm -hmm. the, you know, one ability to teach is, um, or to know is to be able to explain it. So I, yeah, I really appreciate mm -hmm. all of your insight. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we got a few questions in here. Let me see. Um, okay. This is a good one. What's the best way to teach someone who has a tendency to only hear what they want to hear? That's a great question. So um, first of all, I'm super curious if it's an adult or a child. Um, either way, you kind of deal with it similarly. Uh, you have more authority if it's a student teacher relationship. So the relationship itself in the structure gives a little more energy to them being obedient or listening to you. If it's an adult, my my, my automatic go-to is first of all, what are we trying to create here? So if they're there, if they only want to hear what they want to hear, they're, um, they, they have some resistance I, and I can't, I, I don't know what the field is. So I'm, I'm just imagining things. Um, but like th there's resistance for some reason, usually when there's resistance, there's fear. And so when we commit to resistance more than the action it takes to have a breakthrough or to follow through is because we don't think the pain we perceive even if it's subconscious that the pain of that breakthrough is going to be greater than the pain of staying there um, and so what we get to do as teachers is irrigate that desert so to speak and wake them up to a vision so my question would be if they're just like uh just it feels like it's a stonewall situation would be, what do you want to create here? And so it's a, if it's a business, if it's a client that I'm coaching and how to build a business, my question would be, what do you want to create here? And then I would listen. And I'm like, what do you think it takes to create that? And I would listen. Maybe they would say, well, that's why I hired you. I'm like, okay, I do know what it takes to create that. And it's going to take these three things and what I perceive is whenever I bring this up, I see resistance around it for you. So tell me more about that. What's going on there? Because in order for you to get the results, we get to deal with this. You know, and like I said, I don't know what specifically what the situation is, but that's where my mind goes and how I would deal with it. I, they need a vision that, and they need that push. They're like, oh, actually, this is the very thing I need to do to get here because that's the other thing our clients don't get, our students don't get. They don't know. That's that you know part of the coaching thing. They don't know 
they just see this ending milestone over here and they're like, I want to be there. They don't understand what all the mini milestones are to get there, which is why they need a coach. As the coach, you should know that. And, and so you see they need to go to here, then this milestone, then this milestone, then this milestone in order to get here. They think they can just go here and you're going to give them some magic fairy dust to make them go there. And we have to keep reorienting them to the hard work, the form, the facilitator stuff. Hey, actually, got to do this stuff. They just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And in a similar like vein, you know, how do you help someone who believes they simply don't have the capacity to learn something? You know, for example, someone who just says, oh, I just can't do math. You know, that's just mm. not something I can do, which yeah. I see happen a lot, maybe with like adults as well, right. you know, calling out myself. Uh, yeah, I, I've thought that for a long time about myself with the math thing. And I mean, um, I don't know how to answer this without letting my religious views come through. <laughs> um, but I just believe that our minds were created in a way that is, we have the ability to perceive truth, but they're kind of like superpowers. Um, like, okay, when the flash gets his powers, um, he's a hot mess when he first gets them. He's running into stuff. He's making a mess. He's breaking stuff. He is not a hero. He is not a hero. He's causing problems. Um, but when certain people get a hold of him and they start training him, they cultivate his powers and now he is amazing. Okay, obviously I'm a Flash fan, um, but he's amazing and he can do amazing things. We each have innate powers in our, in our beings. We have physical powers. We have um, like other immaterial powers, we also have intellectual powers, um, like, which is what I spend all of my time thinking about, like the classical liberal arts, which is what we do at Perea, are is like the means by which we cultivate the seven sets of intellectual powers. And so what I would say to somebody who says they can't do math, their organ that perceives reality in that way is like atrophied. Not that they don't have the ability, but that for whatever reason, the people in charge of their education did such a poor job at awakening and cultivating and building up that organ that it's hard for them to perceive truth in a mathematical way. But it's not that they can't. They were created to perceive truth in all ways. And for whatever reason, that was hijacked for them, which makes me mad because that shouldn't be hijacked for many of us. And it was for me. I was just passed through math because they liked me. I was like, are you serious? Now I'm like over here mad about it. I'm like, who knows? I could be a physicist or something. And now, you know, <laughs> I didn't get the chance. They stole it from me. They didn't even try. Um, so that's what I would say. Wow. Yeah. And going back to what you said, you know, when you're talking about those teaching styles um, and helping folks kind of have this knowledge and actually activating those things, you know, how do you figure out which of those five teaching styles to use? Is it based on how the person learns best or how you teach best or is it you know about a certain topic that you're teaching that's a great question okay so um a very unsatisfying or dissatisfying answer would be it just takes time um because what happens is in the moment you're listening to your students and you'll hear them say something okay for example so right now in my high school class we're teaching the Aeneid and discussion has been dead dead. And so we're like, me and my assistant teacher, we're like, is this just, you know, half the people have senioritis, the other half have like, you know, end of the year, like, why are we still in school? Um, or did they not read? Or did they um, not understand it? So did they not read? Is it a knowledge thing? Did they not do what they were supposed to do? Which is also a facilitator thing. Like, uh, is there a gap in how I'm holding them accountable? Why did I not catch that they didn't read? You know, so that's a facilitator issue. Um, if they read and didn't understand it, it could be two things. It could be a skill issue. Like they don't know how to read. It's the end of the year, they know how to read. Or it could be a knowledge issue. I didn't set it up correctly. So one of the things my teaching assistant and I noticed is we didn't have them do what we call a play date read where they just do a plot driven read before we get into the more difficult work. Especially with these ancient epics, they can be hard to understand. The language is different. Um, we didn't do that with this book. We're like, that's what it is. So we kind of like did this um, 
order of operations, figuring out troubleshooting thing. And so when we figured that out, we knew how to shift, how to transition and make the year end really successfully. Um, if I hear them talking and they're like, and, and, and this is where listening really comes in and the experience comes in is I'm listening for how they're using language. If they're talking about justice and I'm teaching Plato's Republic or something like that, like I can tell if they're talking about justice in an accurate way for how Plato is expressing it. Um, in, like in my class, we don't really talk about like, this is what justice is. We talk about what does Plato say that justice is? What does Homer say that justice is? So we just have a conversation. So our goal is never to find the ultimate answer, but rather learn how to come out of ourselves and perceive what different authors are saying. So I, I'm listening for if they're connecting with, with what the author is saying or not. Um, so the other thing is it just takes more experience. The more I teach, the more I notice nuance, the more I continue, continue to practice my craft, the more I notice more nuance and can say, oh, that's a skill thing. I see what they're doing there. Um, so it's also just that too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We've My hit time. Um, <laughs> this has been really great and just so much knowledge that you've brought here. If folks want to learn more about the work that you do or, you know, reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So um, if you're here at Advent, just come upstairs in the new wing because I'm hanging out in this spot, the little Buddha statue on my desk. <laughs> um, you can also reach me at Paideia Fellowship, P-A-I-D-E-I-A fellowship.com or across social media at that same handle. Awesome. Thank you. And I will drop that link into the comments here. And once we upload this video to our YouTube channel, Advent Coworking Videos, I'll make sure to include that website as well. So thank you again, Jennifer. And thanks to everyone who's joined us today for this Advent member talk. Uh, we hope to see you again next Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. here on Facebook Live. Hope you all have a great evening. Thanks.